Um, the, the, the big news today, um, talking tough, really, Richie Sinek, and I would, I would expect we haven't spoken about this off air, but I would suspect that this is welcomed by you and many others because you have talked with me for two years now about that axis of Russia and China and, and Iran and what can happen and how we really, as a country, need to be aware. We need to spend more on defence, increase the GDP to 2.5%. And he's sort of today taking aim at, at, at Starmer and saying, listen, I'm aware of what's going on. I mean, this is, Tobias, it's classic politics. It's the, it's the seasoned MP, Prime Minister rather, against the novice. That's, that's the game. Do you salute what Sunak's done today or do you understand the people who are saying this is a little bit desperate? I don't think it's desperate at all. I mean, you touched on it and implied yourself. You and I have been talking about the gathering storms, the what's coming over the horizon for two years now. So this was a powerful and important speech by the Prime Minister, confirming our world is on a dangerous trajectory, confirming that ever fewer countries are abiding by the international laws, confirming authoritarianism is on the rise, democracy is on the decline. And some nations are certainly collaborating to offer an alternative competing vision. What are we going to do about it? And all this has direct repercussions for the UK. It's all very well, you and I talking about increasing our defence posture. But given our reliance on global markets, our exposure to disruptions in supply chains, as we've seen in the Red Sea and elsewhere, not just goods and services, but energy needs as well, the penny is dropping. Mm. That there is a critical symbiotic relationship between our economy and our security. Half of our GDP is subject to international headwinds. So we absolutely need, need to do more, spend more on defence, increase that defence posture. Is there frustration amongst you and your colleagues that the penny, in your words, has taken so long to drop? Because, again, we've talked. I mean, we've, we've seen, and, and, you know, we have to give all sides on talk, and I, and I do try to do that in terms of the way that we approach subjects. I've said repeatedly, I think, the job that Keir Starmer's done in four years from what he took on, uh, momentum, you know, he, that horrible organisation under, under Corbyn. But now even traditional Labour supporters are saying, oh, we should have turned against. Well, you didn't, Keir Starmer, you were part of it. But I've longed for, as I think many people have, the sort of front foot approach. And I guess, and I, and I understand where you're coming from, but you will also sadly understand the frustration from people who are saying, you should have been doing this two years ago. We should have been talking about this when you walked up Downing Street and said it was going to be different. Maybe I'm being cynical with that. Well, the trouble is, is that those voices saying these sort of things, as you and I have been discussing, are overshadowed by understandable concerns about the cost of living crisis. Yeah about uh, you know, well, how do we fund our schooling? How do we fix those potholes? How do we make sure there's money for our NHS? And as I was implying earlier, there is definite a connectivity between the Treasury, our ability to make the money that we require, allow our economy to prosper. And if it's, in, in, uh, it's, a, if it's impacted by what's going on abroad, that has a knock-on consequence to the UK. And what we're seeing now, as the Prime Minister articulated today, is this axis between China, Russia and Iran. That's actually offering uh, a competing vision of where our global order is going. And w people are seeing right across Britain and elsewhere the changing ge geopolitics, recognising actually we need, to, uh, uh, we need to address this. Many of the world, I have to say much of the world, still doesn't know where our world is going. It is mm. splintering into two spheres of competing influence. And if I can just say... You know, Iran, um, Russia and China are unlikely bedfellows. You know, Iran is a, a democratic bit. republic. China is a communist dictatorship. And Russia is a centralized autocracy. Only a few days ago, uh, sorry, um, days, uh, decades ago, China and the Soviet Union were at loggerheads about the true interpretation of socialism. Iran has long been angry about Moscow, given Russia's long dominance, along with Britain, over chunks of Persia in the 1900s. And China and Iran, well, they would never been really close. China actually sent weapons to Saddam Hussein in, during the Iran-Iraq war, but now happy to buy Iran's oil. It shows you how geopolitics can change very, very quickly indeed. What a dangerous, volatile world we now live in. Completely agree, and I'm glad there seems to be... Some, whether that resonates with people, I don't know, but I think it's important he's talking about it. Just 
very quickly, a couple of uh, Tory things in a sec. I was reading quite a bit over the weekend, it's not on my notes, but Ukraine struggling at the moment. We know that the, the big aid package for weapons and logistical support from the United States was passed. Uh, we've also increased our, our spend. Is it about getting that stuff to Ukraine as soon as possible now, my friend? I mean, absolutely. This again was mentioned by the Prime Minister, but it's been reiterated in Parliament again and again. The consequences of Putin being able to claim mm. any sort of victory in Ukraine would have massive repercussions right across Europe. Kharkiv, which is uh, Ukraine's second city, if that fell, essentially it would be all over for Ukraine. And the delay that we saw in America in providing that $60 billion aid package, Russia has taken advantage of it. You know, Putin has just replaced his defence minister by an economist and to then... do the defence job. That's an indication as to how Russia is moving to a war footing. That's where our world is going. That's the dangers that are coming over the horizon. That's what we need to be preparing for. What do you think the, the, the British electorate would get if they voted Keir Starmer and as the world changes, the geopolitics takes over and, and globally looks different? Do you think the man has the ability to, to, to do what Sunak is doing? Uh, I, my focus is in absolutely making sure um, that I win my seat, that Britain itself rises to the occasion. How many times have you and I had this conversation about us upgrading our defence posture? Yeah. I don't just mean that, I say, because Britain needs to look after our own interests. But we actually step forward when perhaps other nations hesitate. We're yeah. the ones that have the courage to actually lead other countries who might be you know, unsure about where things are going. We're the ones that flag up the dangers that are coming over the horizon. We did that a couple of times last century. We're going to need to do it again. That's the leadership I want to see. Good man. Um, and now, don't put the phone down on me, remember? Uh, civil service jobs dedicated to, to improving equality, diversity and inclusion we scrapped under plans by the Common Sense Minister Esther McVeigh, who's been out today claiming that public money is being wasted on woke hobby horses across Whitehall. For example, and I want to ask you this, in your office, uh, either in Westminster or in Bournemouth, are you going to ban rainbow lanyards? That's where we're at, apparently, with Esther McVeigh. Rainbow I'm lanyards. Not sure the, I'm not sure the question has even come up. I would say that if anybody is going to challenge this whole issue, Esther McVeigh, if you know her, is absolutely the right person to do this. I, I absolutely do know her. Um, and there's one... You're right. There's one other great, great story today, Tobias. I know you won't mind. Uh, Oxford City Council. I don't know if it's Labour or Conservative. I actually don't know that. Ryan's... Oh, it's Labour. Labour. Uh, that drew a backlash for banning meat and dairy products have today announced they'll allow its staff to refuse contact with people they find irritating. Can you imagine whether that was implemented in the House of Commons? Nothing would get done, man, would it? be a nightmare. They wouldn't. They, they wouldn't. I mean, there are some... I raised it last week. There are some serious questions about council decision-making sometimes. Uh, in Bournemouth, we have a chunk of land that's being sold £4 million less than its actual market value. That's Everybody's in uproar about that. And I think an idea that came from Oxford as well, they want to implement, and this affects you because you live there, a 20-mile-an-hour zone default across Bournemouth that will impact everybody. I don't mind 20 mile an hour zones around schools and so forth, but to introduce it right across, it's going to slow all traffic down, cause more, cause more congestion. This is so not a political comment by <laughs> Jeremy Carl, but if you have any desire, right, to <laughs> go to Wales and you'll see what a disaster.